Do you know what to do wherever you are when the earth begins to shake? And that's a very compelling question because as Dr. Kirk Dandridge, who is one of our technical advisors, told me yesterday, if you think of the San Andreas Fault as an OBGYN patient, the, the San Andreas Fault is now 10 months pregnant. <laughs> and so, and, it's, and we don't know, and it's funny the way people's minds work. You know, we, we trend, tend to put in a box those things that uh, we don't want to think about. We don't want to think about paying taxes, and we don't want to think about grandma coming over to whatever. But, and, so, and, and so earthquakes kind of fit into that uh, category. Dr. Dandridge, who was a trauma physician in Joplin, Missouri, right in the earthquake or the tornado belt there they call it tornado alley has been made woefully aware of the problems that you can have with a major disaster like an earthquake or a tornado uh, a, few, a few years ago the uh, hospital that he was practicing in was literally blown off its foundations and and so things like that can happen and the problem that we have is because we're out here in the desert far away from Los Angeles and far away from Phoenix when the big one happens, we are going to be kind of stuck, and we might be stuck for quite a long time. And those of us that live in Rancho Mirage and these communities have the luxury of having wonderful uh, services provided for us. The ambulance is free to go to the hospital and things like that. And we don't really consider the fact that when there is a real major earthquake here, all that's going to cease. And so... Just like our forebears a hundred years ago, we're going to have to take responsibility for our own survival. And the fact that you're here today means that you're going to be the people that do that. And so we're going to share with you several of the ideas that we have gleaned from wonderful sources and technical experts. And I admit, I am not a technical expert in this, but I certainly have had my eyes opened and my ears widened by the things that we've learned. And so we thought maybe the best way to explain things like this is to have some videos shot. And so we've had some of our past and former commissioners here that you'll be seeing on the screen in a moment. And so we should start our day like any other day getting up out of bed. We spend a third of our day in bed, so you've got a 33% chance of an earthquake happening while you're in bed. Do you know what to do if a major earthquake happens and you're sound asleep? The first thing you're going to do is turn over on your stomach to protect all your internal organs. You're going to put the pillow over your head and hold on tight. I'm going to stay there until the shaking stops. Then I'm going to grab my kit, put on my shoes, and then inside my kit I have gloves, I have a flashlight. This is the most important thing, I think, is my whistle. And I love this. It goes on my head. And it's a light, so I have both hands free, so I can do something like use my crowbar if I have to help get something off my husband. And I also have my shoes right next to my bed. And I've had all my cabinets attached to the wall. They are not going to fall on me. For more information, go to RanchoMiragePreparedness.org. you got to be a special kind of person to be on a video on your nighty. <laughs> And she's the one that got me involved in the Emergency Preparedness Commission. Uh, just fascinated by her. She's a great person, and, and uh, we've come to really care for her. And so that's a good point. And so you want to consider when things like that happen and the earth stops shaking, what are you going to do? It could, because when it happens... Everything kind of freezes. Most likely the power is going to go out. Most likely your gas might need to be shut off. Things you need to address on the handouts that we put on every seat. And if you didn't get one, we'll have plenty back there as you leave. You can pick them up. Is all the information that we've been able to glean over the past few years, all the websites, all the resources, all the things that you should do in order to stay safe. But after the earthquake stops, if Marcia was trapped underneath that bed or if something fell over on her and she's plotzed, what's she going to do? There is an organization uh, that puts on CERT training, the fire department here in, Re in uh, Riverside County, twice a year for Rancho Mirage residents, free of, t of charge, will teach you uh, over a three-day course Everything you need how to survive in an earthquake, how to use uh, pieces of wood to crib something up, to pull somebody out of uh, rubble if they're buried, how to identify uh, so many of the things that you need to be aware of when things like that happen. And it's held twice a year 
in April and then again in November. And on the uh, website in on Ranch Mirage, next week you can apply and uh, take the cert training if you want uh, for free. I think it's probably first come, first serve, and it might fill uh, quite quickly. And it is held over on, in Thousand Palms on Ramon Road there at the uh, Roy Wilson uh, Fire Complex. And I had a chance to do it last year or year before, and it really opened my eyes, and it was a wonderful opportunity. So thinking about Marcia there in bed, that's really something to think about. So if Marcia took care of her, <laughs> not that I'm thinking about Marcia in bed, okay? <laughs> Let's get that clear. I'm so glad my wife isn't here to see this tonight, but all right. So let's go to Mayor Smotrich's house for a moment, if we can. And our friend Larry, who was a commissioner last year, is going to tell us all about this. My name is Larry Fredericks, and I'm on the uh, Rancho Mirage Emergency Preparedness Commission. And I've been on it for about five years. This is a very important public service announcement we're doing today because we have one major problem in this valley, and that's earthquakes. We live in a very sheltered place. We have to get the materials that are necessary for our, for our survival. So I'm going to take us through a little bit of that today. There is more information on this in the Rancho Mirage Public Library, online, etc. We are not here to scare you but you're going to need to have at least one gallon of water per person per day for a minimum of 10 days. That's before real help is going to be able to get to you in your place. Please remember, hospitals are going to be shut down. Yes, hospitals are going to be shut down. They will not be accepting patients coming in. Okay, let's go. Not to make this Funny, but a lot of these items you wouldn't have thought of, and you're going to have to think of them now. This is a portable toilet, rope, if you have to climb, a crowbar, in case there's anything on top of your loved ones that needs to be pried up. That's the crowbar for that. Here's a fabulous flashlight, radio, and cell phone charger that is just three in one, and it does everything. Light sticks, quake hold, a transfer pump that can get gasoline from one car to another. Think about it. You're going to need that too. Appliance hose, general purpose fasteners, tarps, tarps. You also want to be able to put up a tent somewhere outside because when these buildings go, there's going to be debris falling from the aftershocks for a long period of time. Flood protection. This replaces the old sandbags which you used to put up. It's inflatable and they work perfectly. Again, just something to shelter yourself from the elements. Remember, we live in a, in a place with extreme climates. Very, very hot in the summer, and those desert nights get cold. So please get some sort of shelter. It could be a pup tent, and it could, or it could be a bigger tent to hold your family and your pets. Let's get into food. Our friend who gave us these foodstuffs is a big fan of albacore tuna. You don't have to have albacore tuna. You could have whatever kind of tuna you want. Organic soups are perfect. Skippy peanut butter, high energy. Pink salmon in a can, fabulous. Baked beans, pear halves. These canned fruits are important because there's a lot of natural sugar in them. And that's something you're going to need in your system when you're out in the, in the outside. Chili. Chili beans, macaroni beef, premium salt crackers. You get the idea. Olives. Just sit down and take a few minutes to try to calculate and figure out what you like to eat that's going to be handy in a can or easy to use. But there's a lot to think about and I don't want to fill your brains with too much info, but I'm trying to cover key points such as medications. Please, please try to back up at least two weeks of medications because you're not going to be able to go to a pharmacy uh, at all. So please, again, 
two weeks minimum. Make sure you have all your documents easy and be able to get at them and take them with you because one never knows, fires, tumbling, things may destroy all your, all your files and your file cabinets, so please do that. Now, money. I, I recommend that you take that pocket change in those 20s and 30s that you have hidden in places and put them in a place that you're going to be able to take with you when you go outside the quake, your quake area. Because bottle of, bottles of water may cost $20 a piece. You don't know. There's going to be gouging. There's going to be everyone running for the few supplies that are left until replacement comes in. The highways may be broken. There may be no way for trucks to get in here for 10 days to two weeks. So just take that as a warning and get to put that money aside. It's important that you keep small change in this amount because no one's going to be able to go to a cash register and give you change. So just keep that ones, fives, tens, twenties in pocket change and I think that will stand you in good stead during the emergency. Too much information? Well, probably not enough. Okay, we also suggest you get your video camera or someone who can do the video for you. Go around your house and take pictures of everything that is of value. Because when things are destroyed, you're going to be able to go to the insurance company and say, here is my record. If you have 50 pairs of shoes and there's three left, you'll be able to prove it. I don't have to tell you to have medical supplies, but make sure you have some heavy duty gauze and bandages in there because you don't know what the extent of the injuries are gonna happen. And a tourniquet would be good to have in there too in case, in case there's bleeding. Why not prepare a little go kit where you'll have the medicines and you'll have the first aid kit and don't forget heavy clothes. If it's the time of year when the big one comes and it's cold, you're gonna need bundles and bundles of clothing to keep warm. Keep your gas tank half full at all times because you never know when you're gonna have to get in the car and drive out of here. All right, I hope I haven't scared everyone, but in a way, I hope I did scare everyone because I want you to all get together, go online, go to the library, and look up what you need. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Larry made a point about keeping your gas tank uh, full. You know what, if, it's, uh, if we're in the middle of August and we have an earthquake and all the power goes, how are you gonna stay cool? If you've got a full tank of gas, at least you can go in the car and cool off of the AC for five or 10 minutes. And also, if you have one of those uh, generators like uh, I do at home that I've never used, and I don't know if I can get it to start, but if I can, by gosh, it's gonna give me electricity, but it's gonna run on gas. So it's not a bad idea. I, I know the uh, fire department always says, oh, you shouldn't keep gas, but I always keep a can of gas around just, to, just, just in case. And uh, so, pardon me? And propane as well? Yeah. Excellent. I, I keep a couple of the, um, what do they call, blue rhino tanks uh, for our barbecue when I destroy our food uh, whenever we barbecue. And, uh, and that works out good too. And by the way, after uh, we get all done here, if you guys have any questions, we'll have the, I'm not an expert, but we have some experts here, and they'll uh, be able to join us up here, and uh, you can schmooze with them if you want. Now, you saw Marcia Stein in her 90 a couple minutes ago, but uh, we, want, we want to tell you that Marcia was also an educator for many years and a wonderful person, and she took a, the opportunity uh, to film some kids. But first, we're going to show you what happens when you're at the office in an earthquake, and uh, because it happens, so check this out. If an earthquake occurs while I'm in my office, I'm gonna move away from the window and get on my hands and knees under my desk and grab onto the legs of the table until the shaking stops. I will crawl beneath a desk or table. I will place one hand on the back of my neck while holding that arm closely against the back of my head for protection. I will also grab a leg of the desk or table to keep it above me as the earth shakes. When that happens, you know, you think, well, it's stable, but <clears throat> someone described to me uh, when an earthquake happens, a big one like we're expecting, the flat screen TV that you have mounted on your wall has the capability of going completely across your room and landing at that same height and hitting the other wall. That's a, that's a lot of acceleration. Hopefully it won't happen in our lifetimes, but we have to prepare for it, and it, you know, it, it just might happen. And so you want to consider that. And also, if you have a business, a great many businesses that uh, are shut down during an earthquake never open again.
And so we have tailored one of these talks that is going to be happening in June for business people, uh, a business emergency response training. And we're going to have a gentleman from the uh, Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla in Indians that is their uh, damage expert. And he's going to come. And so for those of you that have a small business, he's going to help you prepare a uh, list that you can run down so that you can open. Because when the... Uh, as people are recovering from the earthquake, isn't going to be great if you're going to be able to get your business open soon so that you can start making money again and serve the people that will be uh, poorly served by those people that haven't been prepared. Now, Marcia, uh, being an educator, she thought it was important to, to talk to the kids, so we went up to the uh, grade school up here, and she had a little chat with the kids. Anybody know where they have one of these in their house? Do you have one in your house? a wrench to turn off the gas extinguisher. But this is really important to have at home, and you need to have it not in your drawer, not in the kitchen, but next to where your gas main is, where you can actually turn it off. Right there. Very simple. You can, you can turn it off with this. So this is important. If you don't have one, tell your parents. You can get them at Home Depot or any of the stores around here, and um, it can be used to turn off the gas. Okay, everybody pretend like you're writing and you're doing your... You know, oh man, they're so busy and blah, blah, blah. Okay, and earthquake! Wow. Wow. Very good. Let's be safe! Nice kids, huh? It gives me faith for the future. Back when I was a kid like that, we were uh, we would always uh, prepare for a nuclear attack. And so, I, mean, I don't know... If, if you're the same age as I am, but I, and what, what a futile exercise that was, but at least, at least they were thinking about it, you know? But I think we're most likely, more likely to have this happen. But it's nice, the kids, they're very aware of this and we appreciate it. Now, what happens if you're at a cinema? And so we have Stan McKenzie, who was on our commission and had to leave because his wife has a business up in uh, Washington State. And so he has unfortunately left our uh, uh, commission, but what a great guy and he really knows this stuff. So check Stan out in the theater. If an earthquake occurs and I'm in a theater, I'm going to get down in front of the, my theater seat I will drop to my knees and bend forward as far as possible and clasp my hands across the back of my neck. I will pull my arms along the back of my head for a maximum protection of my head. If there isn't room, I will stay in my seat, lean forward as far as possible and put my head down. And I will pull my arms closely along the back of my head for maximum protection. That is our commissioner, Chairman Mary Lou Souter. How about a nice hand for her? She's done, she's done wonderful things. She's great. I love being on this Emergency Preparedness Commission because they're all such nice people. Now, here's a, an example. If you go to Costco, what are you going to do? You're right out in the middle of nowhere. So let's check this out and see. We have a major earthquake. I don't have time to go anywhere. I need to find the closest place. Lucky for me. I'm going to turn away and protect my head. Or I may want to take this, hold on, and protect myself. So when you're in a place like this, and there's any place that you can get into, just go ahead. You've got a huge roll cage here. Get on in here and just hang on. For more information, go to RanchoMiragePreparedness.org. Pretty smart, huh? You kind of have to be situationally aware, you know? It can happen wherever, you know? You never know where you're going to be when it happens. So you just kind of kind of think about it as you're uh, uh, walking through. And, uh, and so your subconscious mind, after thinking about that for a while, will automatically give you cues like that. Now, uh, Stan, uh, before he left, was kind enough to give us an opportunity to see What's in his emergency go bag? If, if you're going to have stuff that you need in a bag, you should usually leave it in your car. Because no matter where you are, your car is usually with you. So if you got your bag at home and you're out at Costco, it's going to do you no good, right? So let's take a look and see what Stan's got. Hello, I'm Stan McKenzie. I am a commissioner with the Rancher Mirage Emergency Preparedness Commission. I also have uh, been spent many years with the American Red Cross as a first responder, hurricane chaser, and uh, setting things up as a logistics specialist. 
I want to show you what a emergency bag looks like for about a three day supply of food, water, and emergency supplies that you're going to need if there's an earthquake. So I enjoy carrying my to-go bag around in a suitcase. It is a regular in-flight suitcase, has four wheels on it, and it makes it so I'm not carrying that on my back. Um, in this, I have this broken down into several different areas. So this is my food and water. Uh, I have a three-day supply. I have, uh, these are really not too tasty, but they do keep you alive. I keep some snacks because um, in a disaster, you don't want to be denying yourself of uh, very much. I keep uh, not only water, but I also have water for purification. This happens to be from a company by the name of Sawyer. And I have two different types. I can make a bag of water for myself out of uh, a lake, or I can also use, um, I can make it into a, uh, put it into a thermos of some sort. I also have my medical supplies. I carry a first aid kit with me, and also little heating uh, hottie things, and boy, don't forget the suntan lotion, at least number 30 or above. Uh, this bag is for personal uh, and data. So I have every, all my stuff is backed up on a, on a little thumb drive. And I've got things like my insurance uh, is I've taken photographs of my insurance uh, documents and other personal things that I'd like to have uh, with me. I have my own personal medications in here for allergies and, uh, and any uh, other type of uh, prescriptions that I need. Uh, always carry some dollars with you, and I would recommend at least uh, four or five hundred dollars in very small bills. Um, I have a radio that uh, is very old and has been around, but it also still works, and it is a crank kind. I do have, but didn't bring with me, a a uh, recharger for my cell phone, and I would recommend you get uh, one of those that's a crank or two. An extra pair of uh, clothes for for uh, changing into uh, lights. I have flashlights, extra batteries, the little braking type of lights, uh, and also I carry a Lucy with me. Uh, Lucy's are inflatable solar lights, and and they make a lantern. Uh, you you blow them up, and they also are and again solar, so you don't have to worry about um, uh, batteries for those. I'm gonna go over here. I carry cooling cloths to keep myself cool. Um, I also carry tools. Bag of tools will come in handy regardless of what you have. I also have what is known as a giggly saw that uh, can cut limbs and um, also have a crowbar. Extra, extra rope, you're always gonna need rope in a disaster. Carry a couple of hats, one for my wife, one for myself, and a four uh, by nine tarp. In my medical, I carry uh, several different uh, things. Uh, always have gloves on hand. One of my favorite things is this. It's a little bag that I put two triangular bandages in. I put some band-aids in. I've got uh, three four by four gauze pads and a pair of gloves. Almost every type of uh, emergency that you're going to have uh, that's bleeding can be taken care of with, uh, with this. And the triangular bandages can be used for using on splints uh, to, to keep somebody, hook somebody up to a splint. Uh, I also have respirators, uh, at least a NIOSH 95 or above uh, uh, mask, excuse me, not respirator, re mask. Much more, uh, much more comfortable to be in a room that is just turned into powder when you actually have your face uh, covered and you're not breathing that stuff. So plasterboard, wallboard uh, turns into powder in, a, in uh, earthquakes. Uh, in this bag, I have a couple of, of uh, extra thermal blankets uh, that I've got with me here. I've got matches. I carry an extra set of uh, gl glasses for myself. A couple of ponchos, more rope and lots of bags, carry lots of bags with you. Over here, 
I have a all-purpose tool kit. I have whistles and writing implements uh, and paper to put it on. And also something that uh, I think is pretty necessary, have a, a map of the local area so that you can get out because things don't look the same when you're uh, when, after an earthquake. So it's hard to get out. And just in case you're wondering what this brown bag is, I've got a dog and that's her kibble. So, um, and that's it. Isn't that great? Stan's a great guy. Give him a big round of applause. He's not here, but he'll feel it. Stan was a medic in Vietnam and has, is a real expert, uh, internationally known. He's one of these guys after Katrina or a natural disaster. He'll fly into there for a couple weeks and, and go and rescue people. So he really knows his stuff. These videos are going to be online uh, through the city and at RanchoMiragePreparedness.org. If you can check that out, all this stuff is there. By the way, we'd like my wife and I are realtors to the deaf, and we've really uh, become... Uh, aware of what a great service people like Jake over here provide to the community. So let's give a nice hand for Jake over here that's providing ASL. Thanks, Jake. <laughs> all right. That's pretty good. So of all the people that we had shoot videos, the only person that did it in one take was Mary Levine, and she's in the back of the room over there all dressed up. Check this out and see if you don't think she missed her calling. If you're in your car, pull over to the side of the road, engage your parking brake, and sit tight. Avoid overpasses, bridges, trees, power lines. When the shaking stops, proceed, but be careful of cracks and crevices in the road as well as fallen debris. For more information, go to RanchoMiragePreparedness.org. Let's give her a nice round of applause. One take, Mary. A couple years ago, a young lady was covering uh, for a news crew a fallen power line, and she accidentally uh, burned herself badly and lost the use of several limbs because she didn't know how to get out of a car that was trapped by a power line. It's very difficult to do this and we really thought about making this video. We reshot it a couple times to try to get the best information possible. So check out and see how Stan does it. What if an earthquake occurs when I'm in my car and a power line falls on my car like this? I'm going to make a phone call on 911 and see if I get any response. But it's an earthquake, so they're probably really tied up, and they're gonna be that way for a long time. Now I need to know how to escape from my car. The power line will be considered hot, and as far as I'm concerned, I don't wanna be electrocuted. I need to be very careful to escape. I'm gonna open my car door very widely. I will stand up in the door frame, and then cautiously jump away from the car onto the ground with both feet landing simultaneously. This is a must. I'm not going to touch the car as I jump, nor after I land it. Once I regain my balance, I will shuffle walk by sliding both feet, never lifting either foot off the ground and keeping my feet close together. I won't stop doing this until I'm at least 40 feet away from the down power line. At this point, I should be safe. For more information, go to RanchoMiragePreparedness.org. It's a real tricky thing. You gotta be really careful when you do that. Obviously, the best thing to do is sit there until Edison or somebody can uh, uh, de-energize one of those power lines. But if you're out in the middle of Thousand Palms or somewhere and it's 117 degrees and nobody's coming to get you because the cell towers are down, and what are you going to do, right? So that's something to think about. I'd like you to see that one more time just so you gonna get an idea. I don't know if I can go backwards again. What if an earthquake occurs when I'm in my car and a power line falls on my car like this? I'm going to make a phone call on 911 and see if I get any response. But it's an earthquake, so they're probably really tied up and they're gonna be that way for a long time. Now I need to know how to escape from my car. The power line will be considered hot, and as far as I'm concerned, I don't want to be electrocuted. I need to be very careful to escape. I'm gonna open my car door very widely. I will stand up in the door frame and then cautiously jump away from the car onto the ground with both feet landing simultaneously. This is a must. I'm not going to touch the car as I jump, nor after I land it. 
Once I regain my balance, I will shuffle walk then by sliding both feet, never lifting either foot off the ground and keeping my feet close together. I won't stop doing this until I'm at least 40 feet away from the down power line. At this point, I should be safe. For more information, go to RanchoMiragePreparedness.org. It's tricky. You don't want to lift your foot. That's what happened to the young lady that was with the news crew. It's however electricity works. If you raise your foot, all of a sudden the circuit is closed, and wow, you can whatever is coming through that line is going to come through you. So. Have a, have, be careful about that, and obviously the best thing to do is wait for help, but if you can't get help, that's the way to do it. And I remind you that all these are on our website, uh, RanchoMiragePreparedness.org. And all the stuff that we left on those seats is, has all this information that you can check out, and as well as if you need to you know, find uh, uh, an emergency radio or something like that, we have websites that have all that kind of stuff there. So uh, let's see, and now, uh, if there's an earthquake in open spaces, yes, we do have open spaces here, and uh, we were running out of money, so I was the only guy they get to do it. If I'm in an outdoors in an open area, away from power lines, trees, or anything that could fall on me, and an earthquake occurs, I'll drop in cover. This means I'll quickly drop to my knees, bend my body forward, and put my head down to make myself as small a target as possible. I will clasp my hands behind my neck and pull my arms as close to the back of my head as possible for maximum protection to my head. I'll stay in this position until the shaking stops. For more information, go to RanchoMiragePreparedness.org. Not as easy as it used to be to make myself as small a target as possible. I have to. But we do what we have to. And I'll tell you, you know, the, the uh, when it's difficult, but the most important part is you want to cover your neck. Uh, Dr. Dandridge was saying that of all the things that are most important, your neck, there's a lot of stuff going right through there, and if you can, when th things like that happen, by all means, try to protect your neck as much as you can. All right, we got one more video to show you, and this is talking about Dr. Dandridge. Here are uh, some of his ideas on what to do. I think we got it here coming up. Hello, I'm Dr. Kurt Dandridge. I'm a retired trauma surgeon, and today I'm gonna to present you what to do after the emergency. <laughs> in an earthquake, probably in talking about injuries, uh, the best way to start is to do the basic things that you need to do. And the first thing that you need to do is to prevent injuries from occurring. It's always better not to have an injury occur, because then once it occurs, you've got to do something about it. And you do that in several different ways. The first way is that you do about personal safety. So like we teach with most of our courses is that if an earthquake occurs, you drop down, you get underneath a table or some sort of uh, stationary object and hold on. And if you're out a little more in the open, you can't get under something, you put your fingers behind your head and protect your neck. Because your neck is probably the most vulnerable part of your body that if you get an injury there causes the most devastating problems. So that's an important area to, to actually to protect. If you're out in the open, then just drop down and just wait for it to come over. Now the second thing that is the best way to do it is that, uh, kind of like we said before, is that most injuries occur in the home, okay? When an earthquake, that's doubly uh, counts. And the major reason for that is because most of the objects in your home during an earthquake can actually become flying objects. And flying objects cause injuries. So one of the better way to prevent the uh, injuries from occurring in the home is to mitigate your home against earthquakes. And the best way to do that is, of course, to secure the furniture to the walls, to secure your pictures to make sure that they don't fall, don't put pictures over your bed, and then also the objects within your home like uh, ceramics or dishes or things like that, uh, be, make, make sure that they are somehow secure or at least down a little bit. Say an injury occurs uh, during an earthquake to you or to your loved one or someone that you know or you're with, uh, there are a number of different things that you need to know. Okay, there, uh, basically what you want to do is you want to prevent as much uh, blood loss as possible. That's the first thing because that's the most devastating thing that can occur. And a lot of times this is very time sensitive. So there are basically three types of uh, injuries that occur uh, during uh, a trauma. One is blunt injury, which basically is a flying object hits you, uh, can cause internal injuries, can call, cause fractures, uh, can cause bruising, can cause muscle trauma, and can cause head injury. Now the second type of injury that occurs is what's called penetrating injuries. 
penetrating injuries are basically the sharp objects going into the body and causing an injury. The third injury that occurs is burns. Okay? All three of those are treated somewhat differently. The most serious of all of those mainly is the penetrating injuries because that's where you can really get into serious difficulties. Blunt injuries a lot of times don't cause life-threatening injuries except in head injuries, but there's not a lot you can do about those at that time. Uh, so uh, in blunt trauma, the best way to do it is like with fractures, is just to splint the fracture. And you can use, you know, just things around the house. You can use uh, a pole of some sort, or if you've got mop handles or anything, uh, to splint above and below the injury and wrap the pole with, with uh, cloths or bandages above and below to stabilize the injury. Now, in penetrating injuries, the first thing to do is to control the bleeding. Okay. Now the best way to do that is to do what's called direct pressure. Okay. And that means putting pressure on the area that's bleeding with your hand. Now then, I would not recommend doing it with, your, with just your naked hand. Always put on gloves when you're handling any type of injury because you don't know what the, pay, what the person has as far as any communicable disease and you don't want to uh, transmit that to yourself. So always use gloves in handling any type of injury. So you put direct pressure in the wound uh, and if you can feel an artery, uh, put direct pressure on that. Now the major arteries in the body occur down the front part of the leg, starting in the groin and going down the front part of the leg. In the arm, they start on the underside of the arm and go down the inside of the arm. Okay? So those are the places you basically need to put pressure. Now you can tell whether you're doing any good or not by keep putting pressure on there is that the, the, one, the bleeding stops, okay, hopefully, and two, you lose the pulse below that. Now then, the second way to stop the bleeding is to use pressure dressings, okay? This is a little less effective than direct pressure because you can't get quite as much pressure applied to the wound. But you place some, uh, some sort of dressing in the wound or on the wound and then wrap the leg or arm, whatever, uh, with a gauze dressing to keep uh, pressure on the wound. Now there are also some what we call hemostatic agents which are gauze imp impregnated uh, material which will actually help the blood coagulate a lot quicker, okay? And if you happen to have some of those, it's good to use those on an open wound, especially one that's bleeding quite a bit. And you can actually stuff those down in the wound uh, to help uh, with that bleeding. But again, the pressure is the other way. Now, third way of doing this is to actually raise the extremity above the level of the heart. Now, that's not quite as effective most times, uh, but you can still use that in those circumstances. And the last way of doing that is to actually apply a tourniquet to the extremity uh, in order to stop the bleeding. But you really need to have the tourniquet kit in order to do that because a belt does not work, okay? So don't even bother trying. Uh, and so you have a tourniquet kit with a lash that goes around and applies pressure directly to the, to the artery. And the place again to do this is in the groin or just below the groin area on the inside of the leg or just underneath the arm. And those are where you can apply direct pressure to almost all the major arteries going to the extremity. Now, if you can't get the bleeding stopped, with just one, you can always apply a second one above the previous one, just right next to it. Okay, and again, the best way to find out if you if you're applying enough pressure with the tourniquet is just simply check the pulse. Okay, or the bleeding stops. Okay, so those are two of the basic ways. Now, a lot of people say, uh, well, you need to take the tourniquet down every once in a while. That's not correct. Okay. The extremities can generally stand uh, no flow to the to the extremity for at least two hours, okay, or sometimes even more. And there have been circumstances when it, it's applied for six hours without any intort injuries. And so you don't need to relieve any, relieve the pressure to allow blood flow to the extremity. All that does is make the, make the uh, uh, blood loss worse. So just keep the tourniquet in place until uh, help arrives. But then the other thing you really need to do is to be sure to keep track of time on how long that extremity has been without a blood float in order to tell the emergency personnel that arrive exactly how long the tourniquet's been on. Now, <laughs> there are basically three types of wounds, okay? One is what's all called a clean wound, okay? And that's basically like a cut in which there's no contamination. Generally, it's not gonna be infected, just simply washing it and putting a dressing on it is generally adequate as far as care. The second is called a dirty wound. Now, a dirty wound is a wound that occurs in an area in the body that has a high bacterial count like the groin or underneath the arm or on the feet or on the feet, <clears throat> then those need to be washed and cleansed 
uh, with soap and water, okay? Now, you don't need to be sterile in these particular instances, but again, remember you have to wear gloves or should wear gloves, but you can just wash those with soap and water. It doesn't have to be sterile, okay? Because those wounds are not sterile to begin with, so you're not gonna introduce anything into the wound as a general rule. But by cleansing it with soap and water, uh, you can generally uh, uh, sort of help that wound to heal. Now, the third type of wound is what's called contaminated, and this is the worst type of wound. These are actually have where debris embedded in the wound or you have devitalized or dead tissue within the wound. Or if you have a wound that's greater than six hours uh, from the time of injury, uh, which is contaminated with bacteria. So those are the three types of wound. Now the last type of wound that you need to do is if there's any way you can actually do irrigation of the wound, like with a syringe or with a bulb syringe or some sort of even garden hose if the, if the water's not contaminated, but uh, something to actually cleanse the wound and get all the debris out of there as much as possible. And then the last two types of wounds should just be simply dressed, okay, uh, and uh, not closed uh, at that time, and then allow some professional to come in and treat the wound at that time. There's certain things that you need to have in order to treat wounds, of course. The best thing to have is a first aid kit, okay. It has dressings in it, uh, bandages, uh, band-aids, uh, anything you need, to, not anything you need, but some of the things that you need to treat uh, wounds with. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes this will have uh, other stuff in it, but uh, generally it's the best idea to do that. One of the other things that's always good to have is a pair of scissors, okay? Because if you're gonna bandage something, you're gonna have to cut the, cut the uh, bandage in order to uh, keep it going. Now then, out here, because there's so much sun, one of the things you really need to have is sunscreen, okay? Because burns can also be a bit of a problem, okay? And especially here, <clears throat> so always you need to have uh, some sort of uh, sunscreen. At least SPF 30 sunscreen would be the best. Now, then, a lot of times people don't particularly have tourniquets lying around the house or even unless you have an emergency kit, you do. But one of the good alternatives is a lot of people have blood pressure cuffs and they work excellent, okay? You just simply apply it like you normally would to take a blood pressure and, and blow the pressure up until the uh, pulse stops distally or down the, uh, in the arm or leg. Now, if you use it on the leg, sometimes it takes a very high pressure in order to do that. But on the arm, if you inflate it about to a pressure of about 200, then generally that's gonna be adequate. But again, treat it just like the other, like you would another tourniquet in that you leave it in place, you don't deflate it in order, to perfuse, or in order for the limb to get blood for that time. How about a nice hand for Dr. Danridge? Isn't he great? We live in an unusual community. We've got a lot of really smart people that live here because it's such a desirable place to live. And so we're lucky to have the expertise of people like Dr. Dandridge. And you know, you never know who's living right next to you. And that's why MAP Your Neighborhood is so important. MAP Your Neighborhood is a program came up by Washington State where you get 10 or 20 houses that live contiguously and you have a little party or have something and you can show a DVD that Washington State made and you can find out who your neighbors are, who's a contractor, who's a doctor, who is infirm and needs to be dug out afterwards. Unfortunately, in the life we live in this century, sometimes we don't know our neighbors very well. And it would, it, sometimes it's a matter of life and death because if you get trapped in your building, who's gonna come and save you? Map Your Neighborhood is a wonderful way to do it. Uh, uh, Mayor Ira Smotrich or uh, 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 almost anybody on our commission, uh, Mary Lou is great at it. We'll be happy to facilitate it if you want and we'll come. But it, all this information is on the handouts that you have. If you didn't have one on your seat, we have them in the back as you can, that you can take with you. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. Short and sweet. How about a nice hand for the library? Thank them for making this available to us. If you have any questions, speak to us in the back. And ladies and gentlemen, good evening and thank you very much.